naval ordnance and fire control is constantly making more necessary a knowledge of the operation of hydraulic mechanisms. Hydraulic equipment is responsible for the ease with which we are able to train 16-inch turrets, for the automatic operation of the guns on naval aircraft, and for the smooth action of our rapid-fire anti-aircraft guns. Almost all naval ordnance equipment depends to a large extent on electric hydraulic power transmission for its operation. As a result, a knowledge of the working principles of hydraulics is necessary in order to operate, maintain, and repair the modern ordnance equipment which is today in wide use throughout the fleet. Hydraulics deals with the properties and behavior of liquids. At the outset, we will demonstrate a few simple principles which, when thoroughly understood, will enable us to figure out the workings of complex hydraulic systems and machines. If you were asked to demonstrate that one liquid were heavier than another, you would find that you could go about it in only one way. That way would be to take equal amounts of the liquids and to weigh them. Let us take water and oil as examples. We are to compare the heaviness of these two liquids. For convenience, we will take a cubic foot of each and weigh it. We take the water first. If we place a cubic foot of water on a scale which has been set to compensate for the weight of the container, in other words, so that the weight of the empty container does not register on the scale, we will find that the cubic foot of water weighs 62.4 pounds. Now let us weigh the oil. We place the container of oil on the scale and find that it weighs 50 pounds. Thus, by weighing a cubic foot of water and the same amount of oil, we have found that the water is heavier than the oil. If we place the containers of water and oil on opposite sides of the scale, we see readily that the water is heavier than the equal amount of oil. We can illustrate this even further by pouring oil on water. When we do so, we find that the oil will float. This again indicates that oil is the lighter of the two substances. Remember, that in comparing the weight of the two liquids, we used one cubic foot of each. This is referred to as a unit volume. The same would be true had we used one cubic inch of each liquid. The weight of a unit volume of a liquid we call its density. We found that a cubic foot of water weighed 62.4 pounds. Thus, its density is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. In the case of the oil, we found that a cubic foot weighed 50 pounds. Thus, the density of this oil is 50 pounds per cubic foot. The density of any liquid may consequently be defined as its weight per unit volume. To find the density of any liquid whose weight and volume we know, we can use the following formula. Density equals weight divided by volume. In the Navy, weight is most commonly measured in pounds, and volume is usually measured in cubic inches or cubic feet. Thus, the units in which we most commonly measure density are pounds per cubic foot or pounds per cubic inch. 
We have all used the term pressure when referring to a certain force exerted by a liquid. Actually, pressure and force are two different things and should not be confused. Let us consider a container of liquid. As we have just demonstrated in the case of density, this liquid has weight. The weight of this liquid presses against the bottom and sides of the container holding it. Let us imagine for a moment the weight of a portion of this liquid as it presses downward against the bottom of the container. Let us consider a square column of the liquid with a cross section of one square inch and a height equal to the depth of the liquid in the container. If it were possible, as of course it is not, to take this column of liquid out and weigh it, we might find that it weighed two pounds. This means that the liquid presses down on the scale with a force equal to two pounds. If this is so, then in the container, this square column of liquid, which remember is one square inch in cross section, must press down on a square inch of the container bottom with a weight of two pounds. Expressing this in another way, it can be seen that the liquid exerts a force of two pounds on a single square inch of the bottom of the container. If you have followed this illustration thus far, you have done the kind of thinking that you will have to do in considering pressure. For pressure is the force exerted by a liquid on a unit area. Don't let the words unit area frighten you. This simply means a single or unit portion of the area. In this case, one square inch of the area of the bottom of the container. Thus, we define the pressure as the force a liquid exerts on a unit of the area on which it rests or presses. More simply, pressure is the force per unit area. Expressed in a simple formula, pressure equals force divided by area. The force of the liquid was expressed in pounds. The area on which the liquid rests is expressed in square inches. Thus, we express pressure in pounds per square inch. In the example we have just used, we found that the liquid in the square column exerted a force of two pounds on one square inch of the bottom of the container. Thus, the pressure of the liquid is two pounds per square inch. Since pressure is the force of a liquid on a unit of the area, it does not vary or change with the shape of the vessel containing the liquid. For example, let us take the container we have just been examining and enlarge the bottom so that it will hold more water. We will keep the liquid in the container at the same height. If we consider only the liquid pressing down on one square inch of the bottom of this enlarged container, we find that the force the liquid exerts on this square inch is the same as it was in the original container. For as long as the height of the liquid is the same, the force of the liquid on a square inch of the bottom surface has nothing to do with the size of the container or how large the bottom surface is. In the same fashion, let us make the bottom of our original container smaller and slope the sides inward. Again, the height of the liquid is the same. And again, the force on a single square inch of the bottom is the same. The fact that there is less water in this container than there was in our original one makes no difference. Since the force of the liquid on a square inch of the bottom is the pressure, we can say that the pressure is the same for all three containers. In other words, the pressure exerted by the liquid is independent of the shape of the vessel. Let us go back again to our original container. 
we have shown that the pressure on the bottom of the container is two pounds per square inch, which means that on every square inch of the bottom, the liquid exerts a force of two pounds. If the liquid exerts a force of two pounds on a single square inch of the bottom of the container, on two square inches, it would exert four pounds. In the same manner, the force on three square inches would be six pounds. Thus, we can see that if we wish to find the total force on the bottom of the container, we can see that we would multiply the force on one square inch of the bottom by the number of square inches in the bottom of the container. We can show this in another way by considering the bottom of the container by itself. Suppose we're looking up at the bottom on which the liquid rests. We see again that the force on one square inch is two pounds. We want to find the total force on the bottom of the container. To do this, we must multiply the force on one square inch by the total number of square inches in the bottom. And again, we see that the total force on the bottom is equal to the force on one square inch times the number of square inches in the bottom. We can express this formula more simply because the force on one square inch is, we know, the pressure. And the total number of square inches in the bottom is the area of the bottom. Thus, we now have a simple formula for finding the total force of a liquid on any horizontal surface. It is the pressure of the liquid times the area of the surface. This formula shows the difference between the terms pressure and force as we use them in hydraulics. Total force is expressed in pounds. We may see why by investigating the units for the right-hand side of the formula. Pressure is expressed in pounds per square inch and area in square inches. We can multiply these units exactly as we would multiply figures. If we do so, we find that the square inch terms cancel out and leave us with pounds as the only dimension. Thus, total force is expressed in pounds. Applying this formula to the container we have been using, the pressure of the liquid was two pounds per square inch. If the area of the bottom is 20 square inches, the total force is the pressure, two pounds per square inch times the area, 20 square inches. Thus, the total force on the bottom of the container is 40 pounds. A moment ago, we found the pressure acting on the bottom of the container. It is possible to find the pressure at any point within the liquid. For example, Suppose we were to find the pressure halfway down. To do this, we would imagine a square column of liquid, half as deep as our previous one. This column would obviously weigh half as much as the one which extended all the way down to the bottom. Consequently, the pressure halfway down would be one pound per square inch. This shows us that the pressure of a liquid varies with its depth and increases as the depth is increased. In other words, as the liquid gets deeper, the pressure on the bottom is greater. This, after all, is only common sense. For example, if we were diving, we would find that there was a greater weight of water pushing on us when we were on the bottom of the ocean than when we were just a few feet below the surface. It may help to remember density and pressure 
if you will bear in mind that they are both defined in terms of units. Density of a liquid is its weight per unit volume. Pressure is the force a liquid exerts on a unit area of surface. While the total force on a surface is the pressure of the liquid times the area of the surface. We pause now for a review of the principles we have just covered.